Hello, this is Lee Pfeiffer of Twine Entertainment and co-author of The Incredible World of 007, welcoming you to this special commemorative edition of Goldfinger. We begin with the film's director, Guy Hamilton. This always amuses me because it's never shown. Uh, it's Bob Simmons, who's about five inches shorter than Sean. It's very difficult to swim with your head down because uh, you tend to swim a little bit up, and the duck was at this angle. So, Sean, keep your head down, but you can't talk to him <laughs> till he puts his head up. And, of course, it's difficult to swim. And by this time, the duck is getting waterlogged. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it looks like a wet cat as, he, as it comes off. Uh, so it was not an easy thing to shoot. Guy Hamilton was the second director to bring James Bond to the screen. The first two films, Dr. No and From Russia With Love, were directed by Terence Young, who brought his own personal style of sophistication to the series. When Young proved unavailable for Goldfinger, Guy Hamilton took over the director's chair and proved he had his own inimitable style of blending spectacular action with a unique sense of humor. Speed is the essence of the exercise here. Ken Adam at his best, you, you don't expect to see a rather ritzy-titsy set inside a tank. Ken Adam was already a well-known production designer when he created the magnificent sets for the first Bond film, Dr. No, in 1962. Sid Kane took over the set designs for From Russia With Love when Ken Adam was hired by Stanley Kubrick to do the production design for Dr. Strangelove, largely as the result of Kubrick having been impressed with Adam's work on Dr. No. When Ken Adam returned to the Bond fold for Goldfinger, he brought with him some of the most inventive ideas ever seen in a major motion picture. This is Sean at his best. I mean, uh, uh, casual. Uh, oh my goodness, what was that? <laughs> this is all done in pine wood. I had difficulty with the crew for the first couple of days because allegedly I was the new boy and they were so busy talking about their past success and what have you that they were bloody lazy and they had to be given a good boot up the ass to um, get them working back on. Uh, <laughs> and then we got on splendidly. The pre-credits teaser was a tradition which started with the second Bond film from Russia with Love. In Goldfinger, however, the trend begins of not having the pre-credits scene relate to the main plot in any way. In essence, the teaser becomes a mini-adventure of its own. Oh! Forgive me. Why do you always wear that thing? I have a slight inferiority complex. Where was I? The reflection, I think, was undoubtedly uh, Dick Maybaum's idea, and it's pretty fairly lunatic, <laughs> but it works. The pre-credit sequence of Goldfinger illustrates the unique qualities which elevated the series into a phenomenon. Within seconds, we experience danger, smoldering sexuality, and outrageous humor. We also see firsthand why Bond is not known as one of the more politically correct screen heroes of our time. Guy Hamilton defends Bond's rather unchivalrous behavior. The interesting thing which I've forgotten was um, Bond has no hesitation in twiddling the girl around and letting her be coshed on the head. And I always had trouble with, um, with all the Bond movies because Bond does beat up the dollies, and I see nothing wrong in it. If there are villainesses in uh, Maud Adams, uh, Roger was 
very upset and wouldn't twist her arm. And I said, you know, but you want the truth. Uh, you damn well twist her arm, otherwise now I'll break it if you don't uh, tell me what I want to know. Oh, but I don't think that I should be beating up ladies. I said, you know, you're a secret agent. If the girl is a villainess, uh, you'd never beat up a nice girl. But these are, I mean, she'll have your balls for breakfast, uh, so she must play the game <laughs> both ways. Oh, all right. Beckons you to enter his web of sin. But don't go in. With Goldfinger, the Bond theme songs became blockbuster hits. Played over Robert Brown John's inventive credits, done in the style originated by Maurice Binder on Dr. No, John Barry's famous theme song was delivered to perfection by Shirley Bassey. John and I had worked, uh, he'd done several tracks uh, for pictures long before Bond. Uh, so John and I knew each other quite well. And we talked about Goldfinger. And I was very keen. I got a recording of um, a Mac the Knife uh, that seemed to me dirty and gritty and um, it was sort of goldfingerish. And he came up to my uh, apartment and I played this for him. And I think, um, I think it, it cued him in uh, with Tony Newley and Goldfinger, in effect, is a bit Mac the Knife. He was the, um, was the concept. Uh, they picked... Shirley Bassey, uh, and I think, you know, couldn't have done a better job. This heart is cold. He loves only gold. Only gold. The soundtrack album for Goldfinger eclipsed even the Beatles on the charts in 1965. The album went gold. As the credits fade, the story proper begins with the Miami sequence. This happened to be the first scene shot for the movie. However, most of the close-ups of the actors would be filmed in Pinewood Studios. I like this sequence, uh, the, just the three of us, Ted Moore. I'm, uh, I mean, where are you? We're in Miami, we said that. Uh, now we're coming around the corner. I'm down there and I'm queuing the guy on the diving board. Uh, and I can just about tell, right, cue him now. He's watching me down below, so he does a rather splendid dive, and I liked the fact that the hotel had this, I could come on and, um, and we're on with the story, so water, ice skating, everything's happening. Here we meet actor Cease Linder playing CIA agent Felix Leiter. Linder was the only actor in this sequence to have actually been filmed in Miami. Very nice. This is studio. That's a plate. So we were doing, uh, I hadn't got Sean. I hadn't got Sean. Uh, so it was doing the plates. One of the reasons Guy Hamilton had to shoot around Sean Connery was because the actor was finishing the filming of Marnie for Alfred Hitchcock. He would not be available until the Goldfinger crew returned from Miami to Pinewood Studios in England. Guy Hamilton was not pleased with having to rely on the use of some obvious rear projection techniques and sets for the close-ups featuring Connery, Cease Linder, and actress Margaret Nolan. Incidentally, Nolan, who made a brief but impressive appearance as Bond's masseuse, Dink, was also the golden girl featured in the opening titles. Big operator, worldwide interest, all apparently quite reputable. Owns one of the finest stud farms in the States. What's the tie-up with Washington? He's clean as far as CIA is concerned. Guy Hamilton explains the frustrations of not having his stars available in Miami. Again, this, it's, a, it's an awkward set, this. It's very flat. Uh, that, and I'm, I just have the two American actors there, so I'm trying to intersperse the studio, which all this is studio, with bits of the real Fontainebleau. I always remember a story was at the Fontainebleau, uh, as a character walking along through the lobby and um, 
he drops a, a dollar on the floor and the guy says, you've, uh, you've dropped a dollar, Mark. And he says, shut up, leave it there. If anybody picks it up, it'll cost me five. The Fountain Blue sequence also formally introduces us to one of the screen's most legendary villains, Auric Goldfinger, portrayed by German actor Gert Frobe. Frobe was a little-known character actor in the German cinema when he was offered the role of Goldfinger. Other acclaimed actors, such as Theodore Bekel, had tested for the part. However, there was something unique about Frobe's screen presence which made Guy Hamilton, Cubby Broccoli, and Harry Saltzman convinced that he was the perfect Goldfinger. Like Connery, Gert Frobe was not present in Miami. The scene in which Goldfinger attempts to cheat his opponent at cards was filmed on a soundstage at Pinewood. When Guy Hamilton filmed the long shots in Miami, he used stand-ins for Gert Frobe and actor Austin Wills, who portrayed Goldfinger's frustrated victim. Yes, I know. You're very sweet. He just drew the king of clubs. That makes us count. This was quite tricksy, getting the plates with uh, the balcony. We spent a lot of time being very careful, because this is all studio, of getting the plates uh, the right angles to be able to do this. I'd worked with um, Shirley before. I love her dearly. She's an, an amusing, nice girl. There's a lot of story going on. I mean, the Goldfinger is cheating. You want to know how he's cheating. You want to know what Bond has discovered. Um, it's clarity for the audience, because it's... Uh, unless they're clear about what's happening, they're not going to enjoy. I don't believe in being clever about those things, say it, make it clear, then they have an excitement of saying, ah, he's always winning at cards, uh, but I suspect uh, he's got that, is he deaf, I don't know. You uh, plant everything and let them, let them work it out for themselves, and they say, ah, oh, that's cute, but you haven't cheated, you've given them all the, the elements. No, much too nice to be mixed up in anything like this. The balcony scene introduces us to one of the most remarkable Bond women, Shirley Eaton as Jill Masterson. Although she only appeared in Goldfinger for approximately five minutes, her scenes elevated her to becoming one of the most photographed actresses of 1964. Her stunning looks combined with a sense of playful sexuality helped set the tone for the Bond women to follow. Remember, it was considered shocking at the time to see a woman portrayed as sexually aggressive as a man. Yet Eaton, like Bond actresses Ursula Andress and Daniela Bianchi before her, were far from being the objects of sexual exploitation. As Shirley Eaton's scenes prove, James Bond's women use him for their own selfish pleasure every bit as much as he uses them. Indeed, it could be argued that the Bond films were among the first major motion pictures to present us with fully liberated female characters. Over and out. That should keep him occupied for quite some time. I'm beginning to like you, Mr. Bond. No. Call me James. More than anyone I've met in a long time, James. Well, what on earth are we going to do about it? Yes, what? I'll tell you at dinner. Where? Well, I know the best place in town. The love scene which follows the meeting of James Bond and Jill Masterson is symbolic of the style of the entire series. It is replete with eroticism, carefree sexuality, and most of all, humor. WEBS brings you the latest in world news. Washington. At the White House this afternoon, the president said he was entirely satisfied. And that makes two of us. The scene also illustrates the abrupt changes of mood in a Bond film. No sooner is the audience distracted by the sensuousness of Jill Masterson's and Bond's double entendres than we are reminded that danger lurks around every corner. In this respect, the series is remindful of the work of Alfred Hitchcock, who always maintained that the most terrifying occurrences are those which take place in the most serene settings. In the midst of his splendid romantic encounter, Bond is about to experience the wrath of Auric Goldfinger, courtesy of the first screen appearance of Harold Sakata's immortal villain Oddjob. 
Sakata is not immediately seen, thus lending an air of mystery and suspense to the sequence. Guy Hamilton recalls that Sakata was a bit over-enthused when delivering his karate chop. Harold was not exactly gentle because he was so used to um, hitting his other, <laughs> which I mean that was a friendly love tap in, in a wrestling ring, but I think it, it uh, caught Sean on the wrong part. This would become one of the most legendary scenes in movie history. The censor was a big uh, pain uh, around this time. In two completely different areas, the Americans, we had to get PG or U for the United Kingdom because all the kids uh, go to see Bond. The American censor absolutely constipated about sex. The British censor couldn't have cared less about that. The British censor panic-stricken about violence. And the American censor totally indifferent to <laughs> violence. So one was doing a fairly fine juggling act. Get over here right away. What's up? The girl's dead. Dink? Uh, Masterson, Jill Masterson. And she's covered in paint, gold paint. See, that, that Sean, I think, looks uh, marvellously smart. You know what happened to cabaret dancers. It's all right, as so long as you leave a small bare patch at the base of the spine to allow the skin to breathe. Someone obviously didn't. And I know who. This isn't a personal vendetta, 007. It's an assignment like any other. But if you can't treat it as such coldly and objectively, Bond is seen here in a familiar setting, in the office of his crusty superior, M, played by noted British actor Bernard Lee. Lee was a multi-talented man who endeared himself to his fellow actors. He would portray M in every Bond film through Moonraker in 1979. You're not in the custody of the Miami Beach police. Sir, I'm aware of my shortcomings, but I'm prepared Hello. to... Hello, I'm Lois Maxwell. Now, Bernard Lee, he was a marvelous man. He was a, a very, very talented actor. Um, he was a really quite a musician. He played the piano and he sang and he knew all the old music hall songs and he was a, a great companion. Lois Maxwell makes her third screen appearance as Miss Moneypenny in Goldfinger. By this point, the playful sexuality between Moneypenny and Bond had already become a staple of the series. Lois theorizes that Bond and Moneypenny joined the Secret Service as young adults and gradually developed an attraction to each other. She maintains that the two shared a passion-filled weekend together but were never able to make an emotional commitment because of the demands of their careers. Like Bernard Lee, Lois Maxwell would become a popular member of the Bond stock company and would play Moneypenny in every Bond film through A View to a Kill in 1985. So there's hope for me yet. Moneypenny. Won't you ever believe me? Goldfinger was, a, was an absolute hoot with uh, the hat and, the, and, uh, and Shirley and Anna for the first five or six films. We had the same lighting cameraman. We had the same camera crew. We had the same makeup artist. We had the same wonderful hairdresser. We had the same first assistant directors and so on and so on. So it was really like a, a big family. Uh, every time we started a new film and the, the, the family was together, we had the same prop man and we all hugged each other and it was 
it was, we knew we were going to do something, you know, that was going to be enormously successful. And successful the Bond films were. The first Bond movie, Dr. No, was given an inauspicious debut in America. The studio did not know how to market this unique blend of sex, offbeat humor, and outrageous violence. Only producers Broccoli and Saltzman felt they had a winner on their hands, although both would later admit even they could not foresee the amazing longevity of the series. When Dr. No became the sleeper hit of the year, plans were made to bring another Bond epic to the screen. From Russia with Love premiered in the U.S. in early 1964, and the grosses easily eclipsed those for Dr. No. By the time Goldfinger went into production, there was no hesitation by United Artists in granting a budget which was the cost of the first two films combined. The increased funding allowed for state-of-the-art production values. Goldfinger would be the movie which elevated James Bond from a popular screen hero to an international phenomenon. When it opened in late 1964, the film broke box office records around the world. For many fans and critics, the movie represents the Bond series at its peak and served as the blueprint for the many espionage films and TV series which appeared in the mid-60s. Might lead to a business talk, Mr. Goldfinger's kind of business. I need some sort of bait. I quite agree. This is the only one we have from the Nazi hall. One of the hallmarks of Bond's success, of course, is his high-tech gadgetry, all provided courtesy of Q Branch. In the first two films, the only notable gadget was the briefcase in From Russia with Love. This time around, however, the gadgets would be far more prominent. In Goldfinger, we will also get the first glimpse of Q's workshop, where we are introduced to the ultimate Bond gadget, the classic Aston Martin DB5. Desmond Llewellyn, who played Q for the second time in Goldfinger, recalls his initial thoughts about the amazing vehicle. It's fascinating. I met somebody the other day, and they were talking about Goldfinger. And the chief thing he remembers about that was the revolving number plates. I mean, when you think of ejector seats and everything there, but the only thing he really sort of thing was the revolving number plates. Really, until Diamonds of Forever, I never bothered about any of this stuff. I just learnt my lines, hope I got them right and said them. And it wasn't until Tom Carlyle, who was the publicity um, man, wanted me to go to America for a um, promotion tour of Diamonds of Forever. But I thought, well, I'd better try and find out something about the gadgets. And it was then that I became interested and got absolutely fascinated by them. There are two schools of thought that you either surprise the audience, I mean, you say, here's a car which is full of very special gadgets, uh, cut, and then gradually as the film goes on, you reveal all these magic gadgets, and that was fundamentally my first thought of how to do it. And Cubby Broccoli, at a very late stage, uh, said, aren't you going to tell... Uh, I said, no, you know, let them find out. It's more fun, more exciting to discover it as you go along. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, tell them what you're going to do and then do it. I... So I had to write a load of dialogue. If I can have your undivided attention for the next uh, hour, Bond, uh, it does this, it does that, and the other thing. Poor Desmond was panicking because he hadn't learnt the dialogue. Uh, it was Friday afternoon and we're running out of um, <laughs> time. Uh, and Cubby is 100% right, no question. I thought it was all that was going to end on the cutting room floor, but the audience anticipation, knowing that there's an ejector seat, knowing that it does this, knowing when is it going to come into play, and uh, that was undoubtedly the way to do it, and I'm always grateful for Cubby. Ejector seat, you're joking. I never joke about my work, 007. Bond's first face-to-face -face meeting with Goldfinger and Odd Job takes place at Stoke Poges Golf Course outside London. Here we are treated to another Bond tradition, a highly civilized initial encounter between 007 and his adversary. The conversation appears to be disarmingly courteous, but it is sprinkled with innuendo, suspicion, and implied threat. The characters of Goldfinger and Odd Job are arguably the most memorable in any Bond film, if not the entire action-adventure film genre. In reality, however, both Gert Frobe and Harold Sakata 
are remembered by their colleagues as being gentle, courteous men with highly contagious senses of humor. Sean Connery in particular recalls his fondness for Frobe and Cicada. Connery, incidentally, had never played golf prior to Goldfinger. In learning the sport for the film, he found himself addicted, and his obsession with golf endures today. This is where Sean had to be coached a little bit in, uh, in golf, and uh, this is where the start of his great love affair, which has lasted for the rest of his life, and believe me, golf more important than, uh, than work as far as Sean is concerned. If Sean Connery relished his newfound love of golf on the set, Gert Frobe was equally enthused about the fame and fortune his star-making role as Goldfinger would hopefully bring him. Indeed, his hopes would be realized. After the film premiered, Frobe basked in unanimous praise from critics and the public. He became a popular supporting actor in many prestigious films, including Chitty Chitty Bang Bang for Cubby Broccoli. In 1940 smelt from the Weigener foundry at Essen. Part of a smelt of 600. They vanished in 1944.